Hello Retro Fans. This is some sort of spontaneous episode because <laughs> this whole topic came up at, uh, let's say, at Twitter uh, because there we have some sort of an exchange about 3D printing and uh, I have received a couple of um, suggestions and informations from Robbie. Thank you very much, by the way. And um, what I felt, or well, my experience is that uh, there are some questions around this whole topic and how I am going to approach certain things, how I print certain things, how I des design certain things. And uh, I thought before I put this on uh, my list of to-dos, uh, I just jump into the topic, explain a couple of things, and I'm not going to make this a very long episode. I'm just going to show you a couple of things I have done in the past or quite recently and actually that uh, is well the main purpose of this episode and uh, uh, let's see how it's going to <laughs> uh, end up whatever we will going to do today. So then uh, without further ado let's start and let's jump into the intro. And well, as usual, let's start with a look at my desk because I have prepared already a couple of things, as you can see. Um, uh, and this is, let's say, a little, I don't know, uh, some examples of what I've done in the past and what 3D printing is actually capable of. And uh, one of the, the biggest examples, actually, you can print your own, uh, your own headphones completely out of a 3D material. I mean, you are required to add some electronic parts and a cable or something like this, obviously. But well, you can uh, print uh, most of this by yourself. This is a very interesting uh, project. It's from a company called Head Amama, and um, I hope I'm not going to mix that up. Well, it's the project that it's called like this. Mm, well, anyway, I will add this to the description. And I will link to the video where I have explained this whole project. And since this is the Balkis part, I just want to get rid of it for now. And yeah, indeed, um, there are a couple of other things. Um, this is actually an expansion port adapter, um, which you can add to your C64. And this got a nice 3D printed case, for example, to make things a bit more uh, product-like, so to say. There's a um, video audio output adapter for your C64. It's got a very nice case as well, very nice finish. And uh, <clears throat> this has been uh, printed, so it's not uh, it's not a sticker. It's really just a printer. I was printed on this here. And indeed, if you have bigger projects like the Sidekick. Uh, which contains a Raspberry Pi and uh, some sort of an interface card. Um, I have sort of uh, redesigned the case for my purpose because the original case was for a uh, Raspberry Pi 3A, I think, and that's a Raspberry Pi 3B, so it's the smaller version. And I have adapted the case and um, I added even those uh, this, uh, descriptions or this, um, well, whatever we want to call this to it. And uh, I used two different uh, filaments to make this uh, color-wise sticking out. Um, this is some sort of a more or less a complex approach uh, because this requires the printer to change uh, the material in between prints. So here it is done that uh, actually the, I think the third layer is using a different material. So you are not required to use a printer that uh, is, is able to utilize multiple filaments uh, at once. So you can just uh, 
add some comments or add some some uh, options to your G code so that the printer is actually waiting after the second layer. Then you change the filament, and then it's going to continue with the next one. And um, that's actually one project. And another one um, that's um, not by me. In this case, this is uh, what I have uh, found on I think Thingiverse or something like this. So for custom cartridges like uh, the Super Mario Bros. 64, um, there's a uh, nice case that resembles the shape of the PCB and then make this a very nice and compact cartridge. And one of the most recent uh, things I have worked on and printed on, you may have recognized that I moved to a new um, home, to a new flat, so to say. And uh, I'm going to change a couple of things compared to my old studio because I had a couple of things where I wasn't really happy with it. And uh, so I thought it's about time to address this. And one major thing is actually cable management. So uh, if you are in an environment like mine, if you're doing a lot of things with electronics, with old uh, arcade hardware, with old home computer hardware, you end up having cables all over the place. Whether well, this is just a video cable, an audio cable, power cable, joystick cable, HDMI cable, YC cable, whatever it is. And um, I had them, had them quite a while in boxes, which is horrible because you can't find anything in boxes. And then I just um, had them somewhere in my shelf, which was horrible as well, because <laughs> it ended up to be just a whole mess. And every time I was grabbing one cable, I had at least 10 other cables in my hand. And so I went on and uh, designed those, uh, call it cable comps. And uh, they are actually fresh from the printer. As you can see, there is a little bit of stringing here and there. And uh, this is actually due to this um, material because this Prusa, uh, Prusa, Prusa Galaxy Black is a little bit tricky to print and uh, every now and then you may have uh, some part that is uh, actually just creating a little string in between parts, something like this. And uh, this is actually something I'm going to talk about in a couple of minutes. Um, and uh, as I said, I have designed this by myself. And this is actually a complete modular concept or modular design. So I have actually different types of, uh, let's, let's call it holders. So this can be added to uh, an, an vert vertical um, part of your shelf. So it's actually mounted like this. Whereas this is actually added, for example, to a standard IKEA table in this way. And I have created this in different thicknesses, so to say. And um, then I went on and created those comps. And they can be added to either of those um, mounts, so to say. And uh, you're absolutely free to combine them as you want. And you may uh, uh, wonder about the design, uh, why it is the way like, like it is. And one thing uh, I really care about is so to say um, supportless printing supportless 3d printing this is what i really want to achieve uh, because printing with support material uh, comes with actually two um, downsides or, well, actually two negative points so to say the first is you have to remove it from your print which can be a bit uh, well uncomfortable so to say and the second is you just throw it away it is actually waste and it's not really beneficial for our environment and therefore i'm trying to avoid this as much as possible and uh, therefore i went for a design like this uh, the comps are printed in this way and if you turn this around you can see that those uh, notches here actually have a little kind of an, uh, an edge or something like this so that the printer has a chance to build up the material slightly 
step by step when it is printed in this way. So I do not need to add support uh, to this area. So that's a very simple and easy trick, so to say. And the same is actually for these parts. Um, this part is printed like this. And uh, here we have actually the same uh, construction method. So I have a 45 degree angle here. So I do not create a straight bridge. I just create this uh, little arc shape thing. And therefore I do not have the problem that I need to add support material or something like this. And um, here you can see this, that uh, here it was a little bit uh, hard to avoid. I may have added a little arc to this area, but I went on and uh, thought this is going to be as a, it's going to be printed as a bridge as well. And this is actually the reason for this uh, little string here, because the Pusha had a little bit a hard time to add this somewhere to the to the print and then uh, this this little string got a little bit lost but it's easily removed that's not a problem and then uh, therefore this part printed as well printed nice as well and i even created a third thing and um, this is actually for my oscilloscope probes because they are tingling around all the way and uh, actually they are some sort of uh, sensitive instruments i consider them and uh, i created actually the same principle so i got this holder i got the adapter here and then i can uh, simply take them out of here i made a little uh, imprint so that they usually stick quite well to their position and that's just that the cable are a little bit bended here at the bottom and so I can easily access them. This is actually attached to my shelf right here, just beside my table. And uh, what, what I'm doing right now is uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm printing a lot of these things and uh, add them wherever I need uh, something um, to hold a cable. And I uh, actually started to uh, print labels for them as well so that I can sort this. Uh, different USB cables, for example, and uh, I made a distinction between uh, saying uh, cold and hot cables. This means that the cold cables are just there for storage and the hot cables are actually connected to something, whether it is a power supply or if it is um, yeah, actually power supply for, for USB or for your C64. And as you can um, maybe see is that there are different um, gaps in between those comps. And this is actually due to the fact that uh, I'm using this to store, for example, uh, USB cables. Let me see if I can find a small one like this. And uh, if I make this too wide, they may slip through, which isn't what I want to achieve. But if you have a thicker cable, for example, the uh, power cable or the joystick cable for the C64, then it's going to be a little bit tight. And so I went to this wider version. I can fit this more easily. And uh, as I said, the power cable of the C64 is even thicker and therefore requires a, bit of, uh, a bigger back, a gap. I'm going to release uh, all of this stuff on uh, printables so the, that you can uh, just download this and uh, use this by yourself. And as I said, this has been printed with PDG, um, Puja Mint Galaxy Black, which is an awesome looking material. And um, regarding printing on different print beds, that's something I have learned quite uh, recently. And I have prepared a little video about this topic and let's show you this one right now. So one important topic about uh, 3D printing is actually, well, I mean, most of, of the people are already aware of that is uh, the first layer and uh, it is really very, very um, crucial to the whole process to get the first layer right. And what I'm showing here right now is actually the uh, um, sur surrounding line 
print whatsoever uh, the Prusa slicer is doing. And um, this is actually on a silk uh, sheet and this is PTG. And uh, well, I just learned recently that uh, you're not supposed to print PTG directly on those uh, silk sheets because this may cause some damage to the sheet uh, during removal. Interestingly, I've never had a real issue with this. So uh, PDG comes off of this sheet very fine. And uh, I have used different brands of PDG. And uh, just to give you an example, this is actually the Prusa um, Galaxy Black. So it has some sparkling effect in it as well. And um, the uh, the normal uh, let's say surrounding print of the well Prusa slicer method is that it adds two layers and um, as we can see the line is very very evenly there's no problem and it's making a very nice turn which actually shows us that the um, adhesive effect on the sheet is very very nice otherwise we would see some sort of a shortcut here or something like this and if we're going to turn this a little bit i hope it's still going to be in focus we can see that there are indeed two layers and uh, that the first layer is not really flat so you can see that uh, it still has a certain height and uh, this is actually what it is all about. So if the first layer is too low, then you get some sort of a squeezed uh, contour of this line. So the line is more wider and it is more flat. But if you got the first layer height right, then uh, the first line looks, well, almost identical to the second line, which is just above. It has still some sort of a little uh, bulking so it is still round on the top but um, it is not like uh, you lay a well let's say a round piece on this bed so it is uh, flat on the bottom and it is actually well sort of rectangleish if you would make a cut through it but it has a little bulb on top of it and this is an indicator that you got your first layer uh, very well adjusted and then uh, you really have some good adhesive and here we see a little bit of a shortcut where I'm actually not sure if this was intended or if this has to be a round edge as well so it might be that uh, on this this area of the sheet we may have uh, some some uh, remains of finger grease or something like this and uh, well i mean in close up you can see that this uh, sheet has done already a couple of prints this is the area where the prusa starts to print on and this is usually very very stressed i i'm still not sure whether they uh, keep doing this and uh, depending on the material this is sometimes really hard to get rid of it again because it tends to stick very very uh, good on on the letters for example and one of my last prints was for example this um, venom green material from uh, filamentum was it filamentum for extruder i think it was extruder and uh, if you go to the middle of this sheet we can see uh oh, it's a little bit hard to find here that there is still something on the sheet so let me adjust the focus a little bit so that we get this clearly into view and i had a very very hard time getting this print off of this sheet so it looks like that that venom green uh, material requires a different sheet so the powder coated structured sheet for example or maybe it is uh really requiring some sort of uh separating um, additive or something like this to get this off of the bed more easily. Um, 
my understanding is that this is some sort of a PLA-ish material, so I was quite surprised to see that it is extremely sticky. And um, yeah, for, for this sort of material, I kind of tend to say that uh, you may have to hide, heighten the, the first layer a little bit so that it's not getting too sticky at all. And uh, well, yeah, overall, I mean, this bed has seen a lot of prints already, so you can see that there are some remains and there are slight damages here and there, but uh, overall it still keeps printing very, very fine. And yeah, and the main purpose was simply to show you the first two lines of this PDG material on this sheet. Oops, so wrong button, back again. <laughs> so I hope this was some sort of um, uh, well, interesting to you. And um, the term I was actually searching for is release agent. So there is uh, some, some um, additional, uh, some sort of a loop or spray you can put on your um, PEI uh, printer bed to make uh, get parts off of it more easily and um, well as I said I have never used this so usually I do not have problems getting parts off especially with the powder coated structured sheet you just have to wait a little bit until it, co it cools down it cools down and then uh, it sounds a little bit like cracking ice or something like uh, a sheet on uh, a lake or something like this and then um, you can usually pull the parts off quite easily and um, what i have mentioned at the beginning is actually how to uh, get rid of uh, things like um, strings and something like this and over the time i have established a let's say a little uh, repertoire of tools and uh, I'm actually using this uh, so called it deburrer so this is to make um, to, to clean parts if they have some burr on it from from a milling or something like this uh, the next thing very important is um, its spatula and this is a very very thin one um, it is indeed it is so thin that it is quite easy to Cut yourself, uh, did this today somewhere here, my finger. <laughs> and um, this is what I use to pull off the material, remaining material. Just to grab the sheet here. So if there is something like uh, this outer rim here from the print, then I just go under it and then I can pull it off quite easily. Even this first first line of print goes off with this very easily. And I use this uh, for cleaning as well. So if I have some remains on it, then sort of scrape it off. Very, very useful. And if you have prints with, uh, for, for example, uh, support material, something like this, I'll just just imagine we have printed this uh, in this position and have used support material in between. Then it is very, very easy with this one to get in between the part and the support material, disconnect the layers, uh, same on the bottom. And then you can just simply pull it out with a little plier, plier, how is it pronounced? So, and you can just grab the material and pull it out. So that's uh, one of the tools I'm using as well. And uh, just to show you this with the stringing here, it's actually done like this. Just add the tool to it, and then you pull it towards the front of the part, and then you can get rid of those little strings quite easily without cutting too deep into the part, which is actually Quite often the case if you use a tool like a cutter or something like this or a knife. And um, 
yep, that's actually what I use as uh, the, the finishing tool set, so to say, and this makes life way more easier. And if I have to make some final adjustments, so if I'm, let's say, in the prototyping phase, I have created this uh, print in place flat phone holder. Usually it looks like this. And then if you want to stand up your mobile phone, then uh, I can unfold this and it looks like this. So I can put my mobile phone on it. And uh, here I did a little a construction mistake. So actually this part here is a little bit wider than supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was actually not in the mood to print this again. So I have used this uh, tool, which is called Dremel here in Germany, because the company is called like this. And that's actually the USB uh, wireless version. And uh, with this tool, I can easily get off some of the material. And um, this is what I have used to make this part to work. I have just some remaining stuff here. can get rid of it and then it is actually quite nice. And for the next time I'm just going to update the model and if I'm going to use it again then next time it will fit much better. But as I said I really hate to waste material so I am really trying to get everything to work as best as possible what I what I print and even if I'm using it uh, for for something else like cup holders or something like this so <laughs> there's always something you can do with it okay and uh, well as a last part I just want to show you uh, how I construct things and uh, for this we have to switch over to my preferred 3D construction program, and this is actually the Science Spark Mechanical. You can use this, uh, you can download this, and you can use this for free. It is a little bit limited in functionality, but uh, in terms of 3D printing, I think everything is available, what's needed to create parts. Uh, we're not going to do any stress analysis, we are not going to create complex bill of materials, something like this. So actually it's just about uh, simple geometry and some, some little tools to make things more uh, pleasant in terms of uh, touching it so <laughs> and uh, make them uh, easier to print. And uh, actually my, my structure is that I start with a base part. So uh, here I started actually with the, uh, just have to click on the right window. <laughs> That's interesting. And uh, by whatsoever reason, my mouse cursor, yeah, here it is. Okay, so yeah, so I started with this uh, with this standard comp with the first version, and uh, as I said, I have added this little um, uh, how is it called? Come on, there's a term for it, just can't remember it, a lathe or so. A chem chamfer, okay, so that's actually a chamfer, and um, yep, and the printer has a chance to build up the material slightly going away from this vertical wall without printing into the air, and uh, therefore you can uh, print this without any support. And uh, usually, I create the main part uh, as best as I want to have it. And then I am going to add additional geometry, like uh, this little gem for here, and uh, everything that is related to, to, to geometry, like those chamfers here at the front of those combs. And when I'm, let's say, finished with this and want to add, let's uh, say, the, the last final touch to it, then I'm going to add a little 0.5 or 1 millimeter chamfers uh, mostly all around to make this a bit more pleasant uh, because if you print parts uh, without this they tend to be a bit uh, let's say sharp so um, I mean we talk about 0 0.2 0 0.4 millimeter prints and um, 
depending on, let's say, the precision of your printer, this is going to be a very sharp edge. And uh, this is actually something I dislike, so to say. <laughs> and uh, here it is not important because this part is actually attached to the holder, as I have named it. And uh, it looks like this. And it sticks together that, like this. So uh, I mean, we can make this, for example, transparent. Oh, it isn't visible, okay. So we can look through it and then we can see whether those parts are going to fit. And what I have added here as well, we're going a little bit closer, is an additional chamfer to this edge to make those parts a little bit easier to assemble, so to say. So if you are uh, making this too precise, then you may end up that this isn't going to fit because you have to keep in mind uh, most of the 3D printed parts uh, came, come, come out a little bit wider than planned. Uh, if they go, if you measure the outside and they are a little bit narrower than planned if you measure the inside of parts. So if you take, for example, this distance, this tends to be 0.05 millimeters, something like this, uh, smaller than intended. Uh, whereas the outer dimensions quite often a little bit uh, wider, 0.05 millimeters, something like this. So, and uh, I am I address this usually by adding a small gap already in design, so that I get this uh, more or less uh, easier to assemble. And then, well, I I just go on and add parts as I need them. So if we just uh, uh, Go for the next one. You can see same principle, same backside mount, different comps, so to say, different distance, and those little circles here to make uh, the, the oscilloscopes probes stick in a bit better. And then uh, actually this one, which has a wider gap here for thicker cables. And um, yeah, that's actually the main procedure. And then uh, I added more uh, holders, so to say, different shapes, so that I can put this wherever I need this. And as I said, most of this stuff is heavily optimized for IKEA uh, furniture, IKEA tables, IKEA shelves. So those dimensions are actually meant to fit to those um, products. And um, I have a small um, variation here, so I made uh, some of those parts one millimeter wider. And the reason is that um, if you, you, you simply have some variation in a table uh, sheet thickness, for example. And if you make this too tight, then uh, this part uh, is, is going to uh, bend a little bit and uh, this isn't really looking very pleasant and it may not uh, stay in place as good as we want this and therefore I uh, went on and made this uh, about one to two millimeters wider and add a double-sided adhesive tape to it to make it really stick to the place where I want to have it. So that's totally up to you if you want to do this like this or if you want to use different methods just to keep it there. And then, yeah, well, it is simply exported to a Prusa slicer. I have printed this with a 0.3 millimeter layer height because uh, precision isn't really uh, crucial here. It was just about getting this stuff done to make it work. And I have prepared a couple of other examples, so uh, very practical. I run out of this uh, wall mounts, screw, anchors, whatever, there are so many names for it. In Germany we call it Dübel and I think it is a brand name as well, so <laughs> it's not really the product itself, it's actually a brand or so. And um, yeah, and I was really reluctant to go to a do-it-yourself shop and get some, so uh, I simply printed them in a nylon material, which is perhaps a little bit overkill. I uh, think PDG is going to work fine as well. PLA might be a bit brittle, so probably that's uh, not 
such a good option but uh, usually you drill a hole you put this thing inside and then you screw a screw into it so it's not really so important that uh, it's uh, so so robust and i printed this uh, back actually in the uh, standing direction so that i w avoid printing support material as i said hence those little chamfers here and here just to make it for the printer a little bit easier and then uh, this is actually really working very very well so and then uh, one thing i have created based upon the design of an existing cartridge so this is actually a standard easy flash 3 cartridge and i have created a new top because i want to, i want to use this cartridge for the um, brylevich chronicles i hope i have pronounced this correctly uh, by uh, Sarah names is my good thing <laughs> I'm sorry for that one <laughs> and uh, yep yeah, so I was looking for a cat shape like picture on the internet and then I sort of redraw redrew this here in the Science Park Mechanical adding the whiskers and the eyes and then um, this is actually inside the top shell because well as i said i want to print this with uh, less material no support material as possible it is printed in this way and uh, especially for this one i have used the uh, prusa mmu2 unit the filament switching unit because i have used uh, three different filaments for this one or even four I'm actually not sure. One, two, three, four. Yeah. And um, yeah, this came out quite nicely. I just couldn't found it right now. It's somewhere on my boxes. So, <laughs> and then one thing uh, you may have uh, seen as well in one of my former videos, I have created uh, a so-called uh, Messiah control box. And um, this actually, this case contains two joystick connectors and um, I have created this little case to have them in one place and do not have to plug in two different or two separated plugs. And here actually the same principle, um, the bottom is printed like this and here I'm using some, uh, some inserts, some brass inserts. So that I can use real screws to uh, attach all that stuff and uh, the lid well it's actually not so complicated it's printed in this way and uh, therefore it is very nice very easy to do and um, that's something you may have seen on Twitter as well this is my C64 board stand I have a couple of C64 boards here on my shell which I use more or less frequently and uh, I was a bit sick to stack them and uh, or put them in boxes or something like this. So I created this little stand and this is completely modular. So you can uh, just extend this uh, as, as, as much as you want. And um, so we just may have to duplicate this and then we can actually move this the other side so it's actually looking like this and this fits together and the next part actually uh, if we move this to this attached to here it's not very nice aligned but i think you guess what i want to say and so you can extend this to the amount you uh, really need you really want and uh, indeed the angle is 64 degrees just to mention it and uh, another thing i have created is actually this uh, for yc uh, input um, selector including uh, a yc to hdmi uh, converter uh, it's a the retro classic that's actually fitted in here and uh, indeed this part wasn't printable without support because of its shape I may have separated the, the lid, for example, so that if you make a cut here, 
and print this as, as one part and print this as a separate part and uh, screw it to the um, to, to the bottom part then this would be possible to be printed even without support and um, I'm going to rework this design anyway it is actually just very very hard to find a RetroTing Classic for a reasonable price and uh, because I want to improve this, my version actually I'm using here is not uh, switching the audio signal and uh, because that's something I don't need for my music setup because uh, my C64s have separate audio outputs and they are uh, routed through a um, standalone mixer. But uh, I have already started to create a new design including a PCB to avoid uh, this massive wire soldering I had to face here and indeed to uh, get audio switched to HDMI as well. So as I said, I'm just looking for a RetroTing Classic. So if someone is uh, interested in uh, getting this project a bit, a bit supported, then uh, feel free to contact me if you have one <laughs> and want to offer this. And uh, the very last thing is what I have mentioned already uh, is actually the phone stand I have showed uh, at, the, uh, at the beginning. And uh, this is uh, based up on this design which I have created as an, a GBA stand. And um, this is built in a way that I can use the GBA with a classic Game Boy cartridge. Therefore these uh, little um, uh, hinges or whatever you want to call this and then it is unfolded the same way like uh, the phone stand yep and that's actually uh, all I had in mind for this video it's uh, basically not too complex if you have some let's say um, knowledge about this topic if you have some experience with all this stuff and uh, I'm, I'm very thankful for all the input I have received on uh, Twitter to my uh, 3D printing approaches, so to say. <laughs> and uh, it's it's very, very interesting to learn what others are doing and how uh, they see things and what they want to have accomplished. And therefore, it is uh, very, very appreciated if you uh, put something in the comment section, if you want to see something special or if you have some questions about certain things and then, well, I'm not going to make this too long. It's already long enough, I think. Thank you very much for watching, as usual. If you like this, then just hit the like button. If you haven't to subscribed to the channel, feel free to subscribe. And if you want to support me even further, and uh, then uh, feel free to either join the YouTube channel membership or went over to Patreon or Ko-Fi. And then uh, feel free to support me there. And uh, as I said, thanks to everybody who has uh, contributed to this episode as well. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter for more frequent updates. And that's all for today. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye bye.